So viewers, we had a bit of a dropout, so we're going to start again here. Oh, well, actually, just continue on from what we were talking about right now. So, we were, yes, we were discussing um, the nature of uh, like uh, animals being able to, I guess, receive salvation. Yeah, so we were talking about that. Yeah, and I was just expressing the fact that I, I, I like that my religious tradition incorporates that idea. You know, some people say, well, why? Some people who aren't religious or who don't care for Mormonism would say, well, why do we care what Mormonism has to say about that? Well, here's why you should care, even if you're not Mormon, because if you care for the rights of non human animals, you ought to like the fact that um, my religious tradition encourages me to um, attribute value to, to non human animals, because that religious influence will affect the way that I choose to beha behave and I choose to, you know, express my vote, my opinion in the matter. And so I think it's a positive thing that Mormonism incorporates these ideas uh, into our worldview. And, you know, after all, we all have stories that inform our worldviews, whether those stories are religious stories or scriptural or mythological stories, and whether we recognize them as such or not. We all have stories and and um, those affect the way that we make choices and the way that we together shape the world. So even if you don't per particularly respect Mormon scripture, I think that, that if you do value the rights of non-human animals, you should celebrate with me the fact that you know my, my religious tradition does give me um, reason to uh, give to attribute more than just you know a mundane value to animals, non-human animals. Excellent, right? Um, and so I guess you you therefore respect people who are Buddhists who also have a very strong view towards um, reducing animal suffering and, and respecting animals. I'm not sure what they think about um, what you know how they reach nirvana, but it's more like a process of death and rebirth, you know, I guess. Um, yeah. That being said, um, so, like, what happens when, like, a, should, I mean, should, should we now, if, as we further understand how animals think, as we further do more research, um, and we find that some animals can be um, justified, we, we can justify thinking that some animals have some form of sentience. Rick, um, Aside from moral culpability or responsibility, should we allow certain rights for non-human animals in, in this world? Yeah, great question. So already um, we give humans who are not f adults mm, certain yeah, exactly. rights that, that we, that, um, we might um, of course, we ha we have we reserve certain rights only to humans that are fully adult and fu fully. Uh, I mean, the the laws vary from country to country to some extent, but um, assuming that they're not mentally um, unstable or or have other some other kind of disability that would prevent them from taking assuming certain kinds of rights, then we give them um, the full rights of a of a you know full person, if you will, at a certain point of time. But we give diminished rights to our children, and uh, I see no reason why we should not consider doing similar things with non-human animals. And in fact, we do already. There's already laws in place in most um, of the countries of the developing world that protect animals in certain ways, non-human animals in certain ways. Should we do more? Um, well. Sure, if there are practical ways of doing it, and, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves the questions about, you know, th there's there's something very nihilistic about investing all of our possible resources in helping the great apes, right? Well, that's great if the great apes survive and we don't. I mean, there's we have limited options, so we have to consider how we're going to do the good that we want to do in practical ways. There's, you know, humans are limited creatures, hopefully less limited in the future than we are today, but we've, had, we've got to work with what we've got. Um, should we consider the great apes to be equal with our children, for example? Interesting question. Well, part of the equation in my mind um, should be the probable, uh, the probable potential of the person in question. Right, so it's much more probable that a child human will achieve levels of sentience and intelligence and compassion and personhood, if you will, um, that a, a great ape will not. And um, that doesn't mean that the great ape is unimportant, but I think there's something in the equation that should account for probable potential. 
Um, how much of a weight should that be given? I don't know. That's an, inter an interesting thing to d debate, and I'd love to debate that with people who um, give this more focus and attention than I have. Um, well, there's going to be so a conference I, in um, next, or actually late this year in December, that will probably be worth attending. If you're interested in that, that's called first, uh, Personal Beyond the Human, um, which I thought I might give a shout out for. So that's in December. Yeah, when and place. where is that? Um, okay. Where is that? Right. Um, it's in America. <laughs> I don't okay. remember. The, uh, I'm not one of the organizers. Is it in Boston? I'm not sure. W one second. Okay. Um, and I think it's also worth uh, investigating, uh, you know, if considering the idea of uplifting that, that uh, David mm -hmm. Green have, has discussed while I look up this information, oh, which it is, oh, it's at Yale University. Yeah. I've got it's some it. things to say about uplifting. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, it, Yale, it appears... Yale University, which is uh, it's um, the Personal Beyond Human Conference, is on December the 6th to the 8th, 2013. It's at Yale University. Um, and so who's involved? Well, the Institute for uh, Ethics and Emerging Technologies. So James Hughes will be there. Um, the Non-Human the non -human Rights Project, the Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics, and the Yale, Yale Animal Ethics. So it's got some pretty interesting names. Wendell Wallach will be there, uh, Peter Singer, um, and George Dvorsky, James Hughes, and a number of others. That is, so I think it should be like a really interesting conference since it's very much focused on uh, this specific topic. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So you know, uplifting. Some, yeah, sorry, some sorry, quick yeah. comments hmm. on that, on uplifting. You know, first of all, uh, just the the fact that Mormonism incorporates this idea of of animals that have been that have received glorified bodies, the same you know in in a similar sense to how we imagine humans gaining glorified bodies in the future among Mormons, that should already give a Mormon pause, cause a Mormon to pause and consider well how would animals become like that? Are we just going to let them slowly evolve into that state, or will humans play a role? in helping them to that state. It seems much more likely that the latter will do that at this point than the former. So um, should humans be involved in how much? Well, one of the things that I'd, I'd suggest as a way of considering what we should do um, in relation to non-human animals is we should consider um, them in the same sorts of ways that we should consider other humans when deciding how to help other humans or how to stay out of the way in some cases of other humans. And one of the things that we try to ask ourselves, I think, as good moral human beings, is we try to ask ourselves, well, does that person want to be helped? And if so, how does that person want to be helped? Now, there are cases when we impose ourselves on other people for, for the greater good of a community or whatever. But for the most part, we tend to think of helping people in terms of how the person wants to be helped. And, and so... You know, if I go to my neighbor's house and I plant a bunch of flowers in their front yard because I think I'm helping them, but they didn't want flowers planted in their front yard, I'm not being very helpful. I'm actually probably making them unhappy with the fact that I'm putting stuff in their front yard. So I think uh, the same principle should be applied in our approach to animals. What do the animals that we're theoretically trying to help and uplift, what do they actually want? You know, analogously, now their wants are not going to reach levels of complexity that human wants reach. But they have wants nonetheless, analogous wants. And so we should investigate that with the best of our, the best tools available to us. And those tools are of course improving rapidly our ability to investigate brains and correlate the patterns in brains with behaviors and you know, um, insight into what causes pleasure and what causes pain and correlate those between different species potentially. There's all, a whole bunch of wonderful stuff that can be done there. And I think that that should inform the kinds of things that we choose to do to arrange environments that are conducive to non-human animal fl flourishing, just like we should use these same techniques to help us as humans encourage flourishing among humans. Definitely. That's interesting. So, um... <clears throat> I think it's interesting, like, uh, you know, you look at the different D DNA that we have. It's funny that Africans, I don't know if this is true, actually. I need to look it up specifically. But I heard that Africans um, 
didn't interbreed with well, don't have as much of the uh, Neanderthal DNA that normal humans do. I've heard the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, and in fact, I've I've heard that there may have been, um, that there may have been various complex relationships between the family lines, if you will, mm. of humans and Neanderthals for a period of time. And I don't know all the details of that, but I've heard that our research in that area is suggesting that it's more complex than we might have imagined originally. Mm. Mm, that's interesting. So it's it's it. I think um, a lot of Mormons don't uh, well don't uh, re refuse to think about evolution. I, I should um, have introduced this before, but you you believe that evolution actually happened, um, but you believe that it may may have been guided. Is that correct? Well, it depends on what you mean by guided. Um, so yes, I I. I, I I'm an evolutionist, I'm pretty pretty standard evolutionist, but there are some interesting things I think that lots of people that consider themselves standard advocates of standard evolution don't give enough attention to. Mm -hmm. And one of those things, for example, is that it's becoming increasingly apparent that evolution is rather predictable. Evolution is not random. Evolution happens according to environment and according to the constraints of the environment. And um, we've found increasingly in labs that we can predict where evolution goes based on our knowledge of and control of a particular environment. So um, if, you, if you would imagine putting an artificial intelligence into a, an artificial environment, relinquishing it with an evolutionary algorithm and watching where it goes, well, some of the things about where it goes may be surprising, but with enough testing and awareness, you could also predict a lot about where the evolution of that um, uh, that artificial intelligence goes in that particular environment because you have control over the environment. You have control over the constraints, and so you can say some things. Now, you can also choose how free you want to make that artificial intelligence to evolve and be on its own and to kind of choose its own course and surprise you maybe. And so, you know, Mor Mormons actually look at the creation of this world very similarly. We talked about this earlier when we were talking about that pre-mortal war in heaven where there were different plans proposed about how this world should be created. And the plan that went out, this idea that we would be placed into this world as agents and that we would be relinquished to experience this world with uh, and to suffer and to have pleasure and to learn from our experience um, with a certain degree of freedom. Well, actually, apparently a lot of a relatively high degree of freedom because there's a lot of crazy stuff that we do to each other. And a lot of people wonder, well, why doesn't God stop it? Well, from a Mormon perspective, that's part of the plan, that this world would be relinquished from any kind of like tight control. But that doesn't mean that there's no, there were no limits in place. We have the limits of, you know, the laws of physics are in place. Those are limits in themselves. Um, and perhaps the world in which God lives has different laws of physics, you know, in the same way that a, a physics engine in a computer can have different laws from the physics in our world. That's a possibility. But um, at the end of the day, um, I'm, I'm pretty much a standard evolutionist, but I recognize, unlike many people who um, embrace evolution fully, that that's not incompatible with the type of God that interests me. In fact, I find it highly compatible with the type of God that interests me, which is a post-human God, um, a post-human creator, frankly, of worlds. And there's lots of ways to create worlds. And frankly, I think the best way to create a world, if you want to create a world, that will in turn create more creators, then you have to relinquish that world so that they can actually become creators. A creator cannot be controlled. A creator has to become a creator through learning, through experience, through creativity. And genuine creativity can only happen in a, in a space that's relinquished from its creator. So I, I find that very compatible with my view of God, that evolution is just like it's described in the textbooks, that's how it happens, and it's yucky and messy and very often horrible and painful and full of suffering. But there's also um, there's a lot of creation that happens because of it, mm. including the creation of agency. Mm. Mm. It's interesting, um, you know. It's our, our, I guess the, our closest uh, relatives, surviving relatives of the great apes, to to our, um, I guess, evolutionary lineage. Uh, but today, people are talking about the possibility of being able to revive extinct species, like maybe perhaps the moa, like which died out about 400 years ago in in um, 
in New Zealand and maybe Dodo, uh, maybe other species. Like just recently, there was a, um, a river dolphin that used to exist in the Yangtze River in, in China. The Yangtze River? I think so. Um, but yeah. That died out just like halfway through the last decade. Um, and there's no real remaining species left. There might be one, but it's too old to breed. Uh, as far as we know, um, there are no others that have been found. We might be able to actually uh, uh, resurrect the species, the lineage, so to speak. But also people have found some of the Neanderthal genomes in like somehow preserved and believe that it may be possible at some stage to bring back that line. Okay, so let's imagine that the Neanderthals or even um, the Australopithecus uh, version of um, the our ancestors were still alive side by side with our species. Would it be different for these species? Do you think um, access to, um, do you think these species would be included as uh, members would, would, would be accepted into the church, for instance, um, if they existed, if, if they I had the ability to so. choose to, to, to join the church, do you, do you think, um, do you think they, they'd be accepted? I certainly hope so. I know that I would be in favor of that, you know, so long as they demonstrate like my children do at a, at a, at a, you know, at late childhood, the ability to, um, embrace this concept of moral agency that sometimes we make better choices than other times and our job is to change towards always trying to make a little bit better choices as we go forward that we can really hurt each other and we should be accountable for that and we should try to do better at not hurting each other mm. so yeah so long as they can demonstrate that level of moral agency then I'm entirely in favor of, of um, incorporating non-human species into the church um, into personhood, into the rights of our society and our governments. And I would say the same thing should be true of any artificial intelligences that we may create going forward. Um, and honestly, I kind of suspect that's what we already are in relation to God, is mm -hmm. um, a, an artificial intelligence experiment that's quite advanced. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I just so look at that... So by extension, do you say, like, if we, or if we uplifted an ape or... Um, you know, the, uh, some dolphins, for instance, or, or at least learned, imagine we, we learned how to communicate with them and they could conceive of religion in the same way or a similar way that we do. Um, you, you'd then suggest that they be eligible to join the church. Sure. Yeah, that, that would seem like the right thing for me. You know, what joining the church entails, the reason why we as Mormons associate that with moral agency is that at that time in our lives, we, we perform the ritual of baptism. And the ritual of baptism for a Mormon is the idea of taking on ourselves the role of Christ as exemplified by Jesus. And that role of Christ is to, as we often, as is expressed in our scriptures and we sometimes say, is to mourn with those in mor who mourn, to stand, comfort those who stand in need of comfort, to serve each other and to love each other, things along those lines. That's what it is to be a member of the church. That's the covenant, the promise that you are making when you um, receive this, this um, ritual of baptism, when you undergo it, is that you're taking on this identity of Christ and you're promising that you're going to try to behave towards others with love, compassion, charity. And so if these other agents are capable of such behavior, then I would certainly be happy to see them take a, a similar promise that I'm taking to treat me with compassion and love as I'm taking a promise, as I'm taking the promise on myself to treat them that way as well. So I think that would be a wonderful thing. Now there's, there's kind of a You're flip a side. You're a forward thinking person. <laughs> well, it, it seems, it seems quite natural to me. Yeah. Um, the, a, another thing though, that I think is important to take into consideration when we talk about resurrection um, and there's lots of kinds of resurrection, right? We, we've talked a little bit about resurrecting a species, which is very different from resurrecting an individual mm -hmm. and far less complex than 
resurrecting an individual. To resurrect an individual would require much more information than mm-hmm. resurrecting a species, and we're nowhere nowhere close to that today. Mm-hmm. I anticipate the day may come when that would be possible, and I aspire to such a day. But one of the things that we need to take into consideration, whether we're talking about resurrecting species or individuals or anything in between, is not just the anatomy itself that we might be resurrecting, but the also the environment in which that anatomy lived and flourished and you know evolved originally. Mm-hmm. If we if we resurrect a Neanderthal without an environment that's conducive to a Neanderthal's anatomy, and frankly, without a community (laughs) or social structure, then we may be performing something that is immoral, an action Mm -hmm. that is immoral, and maybe maybe harming that species or that person more than helping them. Now, my aspiration is, I, I, I believe that we should be working towards a universal resurrection. Um, not just of humans, but of all that has ever transpired. And so I would like to see all of that happen, but I think that we need to be very careful and ask ourselves not just the feasibility questions, but the morality and ethical questions as well about, you know, how will this affect the resurrected person, the resurrected species, the resurrected entity, being, whatever. Mm, Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yes, but, but for instance, I mean, I, like when you look at the human physiology, it's hard to to say that, you know, we're born with all the faculties we need to survive in the modern world. And I also think that we're our modern, that the modern human physiology isn't really tailored to uh, the modern world. It's just that we've been, um, I guess, adapting the world to suit our um our abstract wants and desires, but may- maybe n- uh, not so much uh, in line directly with our instinctual wants and desires. I mean, um, yeah, Freud often spoke about this, and there was a book he wrote, Civilization and Its Discontents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it goes into, you know, uh, the, the, the struggle between, um, I guess, enjoying the, the wonderful things that modern science and technology and society can bring to us, but also trying to temper that with our um, instinctual evolved desires. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I think it's really, really interesting topic there. Now, um, also, there was an interesting, uh, like, show um, on TV that people, a lot of people have watched. There's the old version of Battlestar Galactic, and, and, and there's a new version too. And um, I think the creator was a, a Mormon, Greg, Glenn Larson, is that right? That's right. Yeah, yep. yeah. So um, it's a science fiction show, a series, but it's it does have a lot of parallels with uh, the Mormon faith. Do you want to describe yes. some of those? We've spoken about this offline, so I know that you yeah. have some background information here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, for the record, I love Battlestar Galactic, especially the reimagined series. Um, I was an avid fan of that as it was going on, and really enjoyed watching it. Um, Yes, Battlestar Galactica is deeply informed of Mormon cosmology uh, because of the, its Mormon creator. There's all kinds of little Mormon themes that crop up here and there that maybe only Mormons would recognize. Um, but uh, some of them that that uh, you might that I, that I might call out that people would recognize. Of course, there's these these twelve tribes, which is not just a Mormon concept. Uh, Mormons inherited that from the Bible. But there's these twelve tribes that go off to twelve different planets. And um, most of them get lost, right? They're the lost tribes of Israel, if you will. And um, there's also this tension between monotheism and polytheism all throughout Battlestar Galactica. And that tension, of course, is very, um, that tension is expressed in Mormon theology. You know, some people have a hard time deciding whether Mormons are monotheists or polytheists because we believe that we should all become God, but then at the same time, we talk about God as as being um, this community that is united as one. And so is this one God or is this many gods? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Um, And we also talk about the fact, well, we don't worship all of the gods. You know, our worship is particularly directed towards um, what we would call it God the Father in the name of Christ. It's kind of some technical um, Christology and theology going on there. But basically what that would mean is that we focus our worship and by worship, we mean emulation in Mormonism. It's not necessarily the groveling type of worship that you might 
kind of get the impression of from some religious traditions. But in Mormonism, worship is emulation, to become like God. That's how we worship God, as we work to become more compassionate, mm. to become more creative. Um, that's what worship is in Mormonism, is to become like that which we worship. And so it's very important in Mormonism that we worship, you know, God, the fullness of God. And we believe, of course, that Christ is, a, is um, an important aspect of that. I won't even get into the complexities of that because um, in Mormonism, there's some things that even when you talk among Mormons about, they'll, they'll kind of argue about whether, um, whether when we're worshiping God the Father, we're also worshiping God the Son because they're roles. <laughs> Right. It, it, I, I won't get into all the details right now. Thanks. There's some really interesting stuff there that, that's fun, but but would take longer than we want to pursue in this conversation, I'm sure. Um, anyway, the point being that, you know, worship is is to to become like these uh, to become like these persons. And so um, are we monotheists? Are we polytheists? Well, it depends on how you slice and dice them. And we could be a little bit of both, depending on your perspective. But so that's another thing in Battlestar Galactica is that tension. Um, another interesting thing is the uh, the character of uh, what's it, Bal Balthar, Baltar? I forget exactly what, how it's pronounced. But the, you know the 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 evil genius scientist guy, right? Um, what a great character in in that in that series. Uh, he, in many cases appears to be modeled a little bit after Joseph Smith. Of course, he, he has his little polygamy thing going on at one point in time. He has some very religiously um, inclined kind of cult followers. Um, and uh, An he, evil he's, Joseph Smith. <laughs> yeah, kind of That's the funny. evil Joseph Smith. Okay. Uh, um, so, and, and, you know, he's also involved in, the, in these questions about theosis. Can humans become gods? That that question is is a strong theme in in Battlestar Galactica. Uh, there, so, um, you know, I, I could go on about a number of other things, but yeah, the, the the basic thing is that yes, all throughout Battlestar Galactica, you've got Mormon influence, and and Mormons Mormons love science fiction. Not all of us, but many of us love science fiction, and we've we've influenced science fiction. There there is an unusually high a representation of Mormons among science fi fiction authors. For example, there's also Orson Scott Card that a lot of people would know about with Ender's Game. He's a Mormon, and and there's others that we could we could talk about. So Mormons, you know, there tend to be a lot of people, a lot of Mormons who like science fiction, who create science fiction, and and I would suggest that's because our theology already is very much like science fiction. Um, that's not to say it's just all fiction. I think that there's a lot more value. Well, frankly, I think there's a lot more value to science fiction than just fiction per se, generally, whether it's theological science fiction or non-theological science fiction. Um, but point being is that there's a lot in common between Mormon theology and, and many forms of science fiction and a lot of, and that, that similarity is not lost on many Mormons. Yeah, great. So talk about, um, the polytheism aspect of, um, the Mormon faith, it's not, it's not that you worship all the, the, you know, the lineage of God or the ancestral sort of line of all the gods out there and in, in like a, in the universe or in, in the multiverse, but you, you, you worship or want to become like the one that's directly related to, to the Mormons or to us, um, okay. to, to human species. So now that's, that's a bit of a unique concept within Christianity, isn't it? There's not many, many Christian uh, theologies that have the idea that there are many, many gods. Most believe, as far as I understand, that there's just one. Yeah, well, yeah. And that they're all male. <laughs> and, 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 and that it's male. Yeah, okay. okay, and so Mormons quite explicitly reject that. We, we teach of a heavenly mother, just like we teach of a heavenly father. She doesn't, unfortunately, in my opinion, very unfortunately, she does not get near, nearly as much attention as Heavenly Father gets. Um, it's a tragedy, but she's still there. We still talk about Heavenly Mother in Mormonism, so, which of course is quite shocking to some other Christians who, who they, that's just really strange to them. Um, but yeah, so I wasn't gonna, going to go there because I thought it might be too complex, but I'll, I'll try to give you a little bit of flavor of, of some of the complexities of this part of our theology. Um, if you were to ask 
a child, a Mormon child, you know, who is God, they would say one of two things. They would say, well, God is the father of all of us, including Jesus. So there's this God, the father, who's kind of separate from Jesus. They might say that, or they might say that Jesus is God, depending on which Mormon child that you ask. And there's a reason for this confusion in Mormonism. And lots of even adult Mormons still kind of maintain this ambiguous um, sense of which God which God is it that we're worshiping? Because yeah, you know, Mormons generally will talk about we should all become gods, but as you pointed out, there's kind of this, there's this idea that there's this worship, this emulation should be a little bit more focused than on just all the gods. There's kind of a focus that maybe should be had on like a, a specific heavenly father, something, or maybe Jesus. And the reason this confusion is there is because our scriptures express it in some ways that can be interpreted both directions and and leave a little bit of ambiguity. So in the scriptures, um, maybe the best way to approach this to kind of avoid excessive confusion is just to give you my interpretation of them. I won't try to give you everybody's interpretations. We could talk about that all that day and night. So in Mormon scriptures, there are some passages that I interpret as follows. They talk about the Father and the Son as roles. So God the Father, God the Son as roles that a single person, such as Jesus, or such as you or me, can fill over time. God the Father is the glorified post-human God. God the Son is a human who is living up to a, the level of perfection a human is capable of, you know, living with compassion, um, serving and forgiving each other, things like that, as exemplified by Jesus in the New Testament. So Jesus would be the mortal God. And this heavenly father that the, that a child would refer to would be the, the post-mortal or post-human God. So our scriptures talk about these different roles that any number of people can fill, but Jesus in particular exemplifies for us. So when we talk about worship and we talk about worship being emulation, I tell my children, listen, you, we can look at the example of Jesus as the kind of person that we should be. We start out as mortals trying to you know live better lives with more compassion and we progress from that state towards a post-mortal, post-human state, and um, just like Jesus did. So we can all be God the Son. We can all be God the Father. These are roles. And we are told to worship in Mormonism God the Father in the name of God the Son. That means that we should take on the identity of God the Son in emulation and in aspiration towards becoming God the Father. So uh, to a transhumanist, I might say, well, your point is to be a benevolent human while you're working towards becoming a benevolent post-human. You might interpret it that way. So uh, I, I don't know if that makes it more confusing or less, but that there is there's some ambiguity and complexity in Mormon theology related to this uh, um, polytheism and monotheism. Mm -hmm. Okay. So also I, I brought up the, and you brought up pre previously, the ancestral interpretation of gods. That might need a bit of unpacking. Um, yeah. And, so ancestry, so was there a first God? Mormonism does not answer that question. There may have been a first, there may not have been a first. Um, and so that question just remains kind of open and ambiguous. In fact, we even have a hymn in our hymn book in the LDS church. It's called, If You Could Hide to Kolob. And Kolob, for some people, is a literal place. For some people, uh, oh, and there's another parallel with yeah. Battlestar Galactica, right. by the way. Except it's Kobal in... Yeah. Uh, in Battlestar Galactica, we call it Kolob in our scriptures in Mormonism. And it's either the symbolic for some people or literal for some people, abode of God, right? Or, or the star nearest to the place where God lives, as the scriptures would suggest. And um, so maybe there was this first, oh, so going back to the reason I brought it up was this song in the Mormon hymnal talks about this question, you know, was there a beginning? You know, could we go back to the time when gods began to be, is one of the questions raised in this hymn. And it's not explicitly answered by the hymn. We sing this in church occasionally. But it leaves the question open for the person to consider mostly, but it kind of suggests in the hymn that there was no beginning. Um, and that would accord quite well, I think, with many of the teachings of Joseph Smith, who he kind of suggested in some ways that it seems like there may not have been a first god that gods have been um, finding themselves creating worlds without end without beginning 
And uh, we are in the midst of all of that now, basically, learning to do the same to achieve to that sort of status ourselves and to, to participate in that kind of flourishing and enjoy that kind of flourishing ourselves. So there is in Mormonism, of course, because of that, this strong sense in which there is an ancestry of gods. A god has a god, which has a god, which potentially has a god. Maybe it's turtles all the way down. I don't know. Um, and that we are part of that and that the time will come that we can take our place among the creators and we too can have spirit children, artificial intelligence babies, if you will, and uh, participate in that ongoing lineage of the gods. Um, does that un unpack it? What, what, what kinds yeah, of sure. questions does that raise for you? Well, um, I guess, you know, it, it might parallel some of Nick Bostrom's idea of a simulation argument, except that in a religious way. Um, the yeah. idea that, you know, Nick Bostrom has spoke about ancestor simulations, for instance. Mm. Yeah, that, there is a strong parallel there. And in fact, as I mentioned to you earlier, Nick Bostrom was one of my first exposures to transhumanism. And I, at the time, I didn't even know he was a transhumanist. I thought this was just a really cool philosophical argument from this yeah. guy, smart guy. At one a, of the founders of the World Transhumanist Association. As it turns Pierce. out, yes. Yeah. That? That's right. Uh, another guy I really like a lot too, David Pierce, that you bring up. But anyway, yeah, with, with Nick Bostrom, I, I came across that argument. And when I read the simulation argument for the first time, my first reaction was, oh, yeah, this is Mormon theology. It's just Mormon theology expressed in, in uh, software programming terms, basically. So an interesting thing about that is um, subsequent to becoming acquainted with the simulation argument, I kind of elaborated on the ideas he expresses in there and expanded them with some related arguments that some of which come from transhumanist circles, such as the great filter argument, into another argument that I call the new God argument. Um, one of the parts of the new God argument is called the creation argument, and it's a generalization of the simulation argument. So in the simulation argument, of course, Nick Bostrom focuses on computational creation of these ancestors worlds, right? But that's not the only creative mechanism to which the logic of his argument is applicable. His argument and the logic of it can be generalized to any feasible creation mechanism, whether it be computation, such as what he focuses on, or maybe something else that we might call cosmoforming. Uh, maybe we can take baby black holes, instrument them with computers, and kind of control the way that those universes develop, right? Mm -hmm. Who knows what we'll be able to do. Um, so based on kind of that perspective, I bounced the idea off of Nick Bostrom. Hey, could we general, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't abusing his argument. Could we, could we generalize the simulation argument into a creation argument that is, a, that is applicable for any feasible creation mechanism, whether it's computation or not? And he said, yeah, as long as it, it holds out empirically, then yeah, that logic can be applied perfectly fine generally. And he, in fact, he even expanded the FAQ, the FAQ on his website. Um, to incorporate that question that I that I gave to him, and so that that investigation kind of fed in to um, the the development of what Mormon transhumanists call the New God argument, and um, that is an important aspect of that argument. This idea that you know even if personally I think the computation mechanism is quite feasible, um, something along those lines. But even if you don't, if you think some other mechanism for creating new universes or worlds is more feasible, the simulation argument's logic is still applicable. And that's really a powerful idea. Yes, definitely. Interesting stuff there. So um, now we've been speaking about, uh, you know, an ancestral interpretation of um, gods and an ancestral interpretation of like, a, I guess, um, you know, I guess species in general. Are you moving? <laughs> that's cool. Uh, so. Let's you're gonna turn on about, the light. Yeah, yeah. I was you it's getting a bit dark. Maybe it's maybe it's uh, turning into nighttime over there. Yep, it is. Yeah, it's turning into midday over here. <laughs> so this is a bit of an epic interview, and I'm really enjoying it. So, um, well, now let's talk about the future. Um, within like the the future of human species, the future of animal kingdoms, the future of um, you know our society or our our, our species. Now. It looks as though transhumanism uh, projects um, or makes many projections, but a lot of them sort of converge into the idea that uh, we're going to uh, get like more advanced in our technology. We're going to either travel out into the stars 
for um, get smaller and smaller and stem compress uh, and get really quick at communicating. So <laughs> we, we the universe will look just like what it used to, but actually will be at the uh, at really really tiny small levels, maybe at the size of um, uh, electrons or. Planck scale or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> um, John Smart has a lot of uh, a lot of writing and a lot to say about this. Um, kind of a transcendence hypothesis. Yeah, stuff. the trans. That's right. Yeah, the transcendence. That's really interesting hypothesis. stuff. Is, I like that. Certainly. Yeah. But in any case, um, there uh, the Mormon take on the future is the celestial. Oh, sorry, the three kingdoms: the terrestrial, the tele something, and celestial. the celestial, and the celestial. But there's yeah. more to it than that, right? That's right. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> if you ask, if you ask most Mormons on the street, yeah. um, that's what they'll tell you is that um, in the future there will be three heavens: the celestial, mm -hmm. the terrestrial, and the telestial. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll kind of leave it at that. But Mormon scripture is actually far more complex than that. When you dig into it a little bit, mm -hmm. um, as you dig into it, you find out that these three heavens are types. Of heavens first of all and within those types there are degrees and diversities of kinds mm -hmm. but then also as you dig into the scriptures you'll find that mormon scriptures also suggest that there are higher levels of heaven than the celestial that the inhabitants of the celestial degree of heaven will receive information about yet higher degree of heaven toward mormon scripture has this very rich um rich I kind of ideology or, or cosmology around worlds and heavens and creation and, and this perpetual uh, progression of intelligence and humanity into post humanity and, and be. Uh oh. Uh. <laughs>